So what will it take for the U.S. to get serious about becoming energy independent? Well, one noted author and energy expert believes it may take oil prices more than doubling from their current record levels. Matthew Simmons is chairman of a specialized energy investment bank and presented a program called Twilight in the Desert, the coming Saudi oil shock in the world economy, as part of the Samuel Roberts Noble Foundation series called Profiles and Perspectives. And I sat down with Mr. Simmons right before his talk. Mr. Simmons, you have 35 years in the industry. Is there one single moment or a time that you can look back on that made you approach the energy industry differently? It was, it was the anger I got when I started actually digging into the macro and realizing that all these people we trust as experts in the, in the, in the, in the hadn't done their homework. And I, and I got more and more d d uh, dismissive of conventional energy wisdom and I got more and more convinced that most of these guys would go around, oh, here's the answer, just they've heard it from someone else. It's not an industry that has been very good at analyzing itself, which is why we got in the problems we're in today. Now you've written the book Twilight in the Desert. Explain that title to me. Well, when you basically go back to the last 50, 60 years, we believed with a passion, we being the world, that we had found in the Middle East, uh, with barely exploring, the most abundant sources of oil we would ever have. They would be so abundant that oil would last, no one ever said forever, forever, but forever, and also be cheap. And over the last 30 years, there was almost no data on the Middle East, and I finally stumbled into just enough facts to say, you know what, I'm a big enough data nut now, I'm gonna see if I can figure out the real answer to this, and by the time I thought I'd figured it out, I said, I'm gonna, write a, I'm gonna do, turn this into a book. Because we basically, we are, we are at the, we're at the end game of the ability to produce abundant amounts of Middle East oil with a handful of wells, and, and the, those fields are too old, they're depleting, the oil left is abundant, but it's just lesser quality oil, tight rocks, we have to have lots of individual wells. So the, so the era of Middle East oil as we knew it is over. And, and we're gonna go into a tougher time of being able to either grow Middle East oil supply or keep it flat. And, and there is a scenario that you can't keep it flat. And so, and in the meantime, the world based every single long-term plan that anyone ever did on the implicit assumption, don't worry about oil supply because the Middle East will be there forever. So while supply may well be going down, demand continues to oh, increase. Demand, demand is insatiable. In the U.S., to kind of keep our economy going, we, we add 15 to 18 million cars a year and, and you know some go to ranches, but we don't get rid of very many of them. And so even in the U.S., we, you know, we're, we, you know, in China and India, they're kind of the poster childs for about three and a half billion people. They're just finally starting to, to use the benefits that we've enjoyed. What worries me the most is that by 2020, you could have a theoretical demand for oil of 120 million bulls a day. We're at 85 today and, and an actual supply of 60. That gap is not a trivial issue. So with Twilight, you don't see our oil supplies running out. No. You just see it getting more expensive. We're, we're going to the sunset years. It's not even expensive, it's availability. And the reason it will be more expensive is when you have scarcity. You know, there is, there are a lot of economic things that get tossed around, they're just theories, but there are a few basic, when you have twice as much demand than you have supply, prices don't stay cheap. With the changes that we're seeing currently, and, and our energy situation, it certainly has economic implications, but does it also have social implications? Well, yeah, it, ha if it has enormous social implications because if we, if we ignore the issue, and I'm right, and we do start to see you know, demand going like this and supply going like that, we have scarcity, we have shortages, we have hoarding, that, and then we have fistfights. Whether the fistfights end up morphing into you know, the ugliest war, you know, the, you know, World War III, if we ever have it, will make World War II look like, you know, you know, some cannon, some some cannon fights. So we really shouldn't. Even, but I just think if we don't address these problems, and we just let the free market work, uh, then we're headed we're headed into a really ugly, you know, wrap up of the 21st century before it's where we even started. So our energy crisis is much more than just greedy oil companies or supply and demand. No. 
Oh yes, I mean this is this is basically the end game of 50 years of energy mistakes. Let's talk a little bit about government policy. What can our nation do to help circumvent this current crisis? Over the horizon might well be a new suite of transportation fuels that actually start to substitute for for oil. Uh, so my opinion, the only thing we can do is figure out how to use less and buy ourselves time to work on this transition. And, and, and is that a transition into more renewable fuels? Well, it, well, if it's not that, I don't know what it is. It's not an electric car. Uh, that's a non-starter because electricity has to have a feedstock. And so you just compound your problem. It isn't a hydrogen car because hydrogen is a tertiary form. Uh, of, of And, 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 and uh, the, so, so if it's not biofuels, uh, then it's probably, you know, uh, we don't travel.